All right, welcome back. Strategic Acquisition Workshop. We are still in the introduction module, module zero. And now we're going to talk about what to do in session one. So what are we going to do today uh, in this session? Well, you've been told something. And what you've been told on how to invest in multifamily, I'm pretty sure was a lie. Depends on who you heard it from. If you learned like I did from the fundamental processes within the CCIM Institute, then you've already got the truth. If you learned in any other way, you've probably been lied to, okay? So I'm gonna prove it. Then I'm gonna tell you the truth. And then we're gonna look at the numbers. And when we look at the numbers, if you've not seen me do this yet, and I do have videos on YouTube that have this, but it needs to be in this course, you're going to be blown away at what you see. So if syndication is so bad, and that's what this is about, syndication, then what am I supposed to do? Well, we'll talk about that because there are ways to make a lot of money in real estate investing that don't involve syndication. A lot of people don't want to build some gigantic multifamily conglomerate company um, because maybe they don't want to be a CEO or don't want to have to run a big business like that. They just want to make some cash flow. Okay. So we're going to talk about that. So this really is for those that got sold into the idea that syndication is glamorous. Trust me, it is not. Okay. And if not that, then what? And that's what we're going to talk about in this session today. And of course, that would be strategic partnering or like what my title says, strategic consultant. Okay, kind of the same thing. JV partnering on small properties. Okay, you're going to make so much more money doing that than you ever will in a syndication, at least until you have one congruent team that that team is constantly buying their own properties. No co-sponsors, none of this other stuff, constantly bringing in investors, but you're doing your own deals. You're no longer requiring these other sponsors to sponsor with you because you have not built that cohesive team yet. What is a strategic partner? We'll talk about that. The roles of a strategic partner. What role do you want to play as a strategic partner? Fee structure of a strategic partner. How do you actually get paid? What do you do with your fee once you get it? Because it matters. And again, it depends on your goals. And we'll talk about that. And then how do you become a strategic partner? And at the end of this one, there will be homework and we'll finish today out with Q and a. Okay. So this will complete today's class. So we're about 20 or so minutes into this. We got about another 35 or 40 minutes left and that will complete today's session and we'll go into Q and a. All right. What you're told. Hey, you guys got to like my slides. Worked hard on these. What you're told. You'll 10 X your cash flow and net worth. And I don't know. I'm not going to dig them out. I wish I had them on hand already. I got them in my drawers here somewhere. There is a guru out there that when he does this, he holds up these, these 10 X uh, uh, little paddles. And if he's doing it virtually, and then he's got this one that's got money on it and another one with no taxes. It, it's hilarious to watch. Oh, is he lying through his teeth when he talks to you? It's just as easy to buy 100 units as it is to buy 10 units. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard that. And that is such, and I'm going to say it, bullshit. Okay? If you got offended by that, I don't care. It's bullshit. It is not true. There's so much more work involved in buying a 100-unit property than there is a 10-unit property. There's so much more people involved, so much more capital involved, so much more systems on top of systems on top of systems involved, okay? Versus you owning a 10 unit. And, and here's the kicker. You'll make more money with the 10 unit than you will the 100 unit. How's that possible, David? I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna prove it. 
you'll get an acquisition fee and an asset management fee for every deal you do. If you're the primary sponsor, yeah, you'll get an acquisition fee because you demand it. The investors are going to pay for it because you'll demand it. Did you deserve it? Maybe, maybe not. And an asset management fee. This primary sponsor is going to get an asset management fee. But if you're a co-sponsor or if you've been brought into this to raise capital and you think you're going to get a piece of that acquisition fee or that asset management fee, you better think again. You won't pay any taxes. That's what they tell you today. You won't pay any taxes. Guess what? They're lying to you. I can prove that one to you right now. Bonus depreciation. Everybody talks about bonus depreciation and how you will not pay any capital gains tax with bonus depreciation. That's probably true. What they don't tell you is that bonus depreciation that you take, you have to recapture that bonus depreciation to the tune of 25% tax. Yes, the IRS is going to get theirs no matter what where you would have only paid 20% for capital gain, now you got to pay 25% for recapture on your depreciation. But they don't tell you that. You're going to pay tax. Will real estate curb your tax bill and allow you to shelter a lot of your tax? Of course it will, if you do it correctly. Bonus depreciation is not the way to do it especially if you're only holding for short term. But that's for another part of this course. So what's the truth? You'll make more cash flow from a 10 unit than a 100 unit. I've already told you that. I'm going to prove it. Let's look at the numbers. So here's a scenario for you. You got a hundred unit property for $10 million, hundred grand a door, right? We've seen this over and over and over. I still can't believe 1960s and 70s products are selling for more than hundred thousand dollars a door. Blows my damn mind. You got 30% required equity. You got a 70-30 investor split. So we've got a syndication working here. And you're telling your investors you're going to give them an 8% preferred return and they're going to get a 10% cash on cash return. Okay. These are your projections. This is what you've promised your investors. <clears throat> and you have, uh, you've negotiated a 10% uh, position of the GP. Okay. So this is your piece of the pie. You as an individual, you're going to get 10% of the GP. Okay. And the investors are pretty much going to get the rest of this, but let's see how this works out. All right. So 30%, that's $3 million to $10 million. Cash on cash return. Well, if we put $3 million in, that means we need $300,000 out at the end of the year to get our 10% cash on cash. So obviously we know in the market since about 2019, maybe even a little sooner than that, 10% cash on cash has pretty much been non-existent. But we'll give it the benefit of the doubt. And let's just say $300,000 was realized in year two of this syndication. 8% go to the investors, so 240,000 is already gone. You owe them 240,000 because you promised them an 8% preferred return. So of the 300, you've got to give them 240. Then there's a 70-30 split between the GP and the LP for the last 60,000 that remains. So the investors are going to get another $42,000 and the syndicators are going to get a whopping $18,000. Well, remember, you only had a 10% GP share, so you walk away with an annual cash flow of a whopping 1800 bucks. For a 100-unit property, you made, what, $120 a month? Ooh, boy, was that exciting. And the, all the work you did to get there and the risk and now you have to protect these investors and you get a whopping 120 bucks a month if the deal goes as planned. And as we're seeing today, they are not going as planned. So the way it's been in the last four years, GPs have gotten nothing and they've relied on appreciation, that equity multiple at the end, okay? But if you're looking for cash flow, this 
does not work. So if there's a 10% cash on cash return, then you'll get a whole, whole 120 bucks a month. Ooh. All right, scenario two, we have a 10 unit property. Remember, they said it's easier to get a 100 unit than there is to get a 10 unit. So we got a 10 unit property. We got a value of $500,000, a purchase price. Again, 30% equity, two other partners. So now we're JV in. They're each going to bring 50 or however they bring it together. They're bringing $100,000. Okay. You found that 100 unit uh, piece of junk, didn't want to syndicate it. So you gave it to us. I almost said it. This is going on YouTube. I'm not going to say it. You gave it to a syndication student that came from a guru. And they purchased it from you and you got 1% uh, from that deal. And so you get $50,000 that you're now bringing to the table as a JV partner. So between the three of you, you've got $150,000. And we're going to say same thing, 10% cash on cash return for uh, apples to apples. So equity acquired, 150 grand, 10% cash on cash return. That's a $15,000 annual return. But remember, we only have three partners. We're split three ways equally. Your annual cash flow is now $5,000. Not 12, or what was it, $1,500? Not $1,500, $5,000. But wait a minute, how do I get more cash flow? I only bought a 10 unit building. Because you've been lied to. So you'll make more cash flow from a 10 unit than you will a 100 unit. And you just saw the numbers. Now, I get people that'll argue this point. Well, passive investors aren't going to uh, make more from that 10 unit than 100 unit. You're correct. They're not. But they're passive investors. Okay? And they're hoping that that sponsor does not screw up. And you don't need to take this entire course to be a passive investor. You'd be one sophisticated investor if you did and went through the whole thing. But for most passive investors, they're busy professionals and rely on professionals to protect their money. Okay. So you saw the numbers. You tell me. So you will not 10x your cash flow and your net worth. And let's talk about that net worth. If, <coughs> excuse me, if you buy a hundred unit building as uh, a sponsor and you're only 10% of the GP of that sponsor, do you get the entire value of that hundred unit apartment complex as part of your net worth? Well, if you look at Facebook, you'd sure believe you do. But you don't. You'd be lucky to own a doorknob on the apartment complex. What is actually going to go on your personal financial statement? That is what your net worth is. So if the property was $10 million and you own 10% of 30%, okay, remember you guys only own 30%. The investors own the other 70%. So you only own three million of that ten million dollar project, or the the GP does. Yet you only own ten percent of that three million, so you only own three hundred thousand of it. So your net worth went up three hundred thousand, not ten million. Okay. In this instance, with the ten unit, you have three people that are in a single LLC that joint ventured on this deal, or they could be tenant in common. Either way, it doesn't matter. They each own one third. What goes on their balance sheet will be their one third of that unit. It was $500,000. So uh, what is that? 166,666 each, okay? For a 10 unit building, 10 times the size and you barely own, not even double in net worth. So. Don't believe what you're being told on Facebook and in these guru groups. 
you might get an acquisition, might, might get an acquisition fee and an asset management fee. It depends on what your role is. If you are part of the acquisition team, you can get a piece of the a piece of the acquisition fee. Okay. That acquisition fee is shared sparingly. It is not shared evenly across all GP members. And you will pay taxes. I promise you will pay taxes or taxes will pay you in the tune of an orange jumpsuit and a 12 by 12 cell with three squares a day. Okay, so if not syndication, then what do am I supposed to do here? <clears throat> well, first, depends on your goals. Everything depends on your goals. How many times have you looked at a salesperson that's trying to sell you a coaching program and they immediately go into how they can help you, yet they never asked you what your goals are? If they don't know your goals, how in the world can they possibly help? They can't. So if you have money, JV with one or three other JV partners, best way, fastest way to build your wealth right there. Even, even George, who is on here live with me right now, who lives in Southern California, even if he invested in Southern California with one or two other JV partners, George would be very wealthy in a short period of time, but it takes money to be able to do that. Invest passively in syndications, which is what I do now. Of course, <laughs> there ain't but maybe one or two out there that I would invest with, and not until this market realigns itself. It's still way overvalued, even uh, March 28th, 2024. If you don't have money, wholesale or master lease option small apartments. You'll find lower uh, on the YouTube channel in a playlist called Master Lease Option Workshop. You will uh, you can see how to do a master lease option and how that can be the only true no money down strategy. And then of course, be a strategic partner. So let's talk about strategic partnering. Now, very early on, this was a group of strategic partners. There's me right here in the red shirt uh, that we met in Chicago. Uh, we did the first um, GOB conference, if you will. I think this was three years ago. Um, and we had a good time. This, this was uh, all of us together. I can name about three quarters of these people that are in this picture. So what is a strategic partner? It's a company or organization that has an arrangement to work with or help another so that it is easier for each one of them to achieve the thing they want to achieve. I want to read that again. That is a powerful statement. A company or organization that has an arrangement to work or help another. Help, mm, key word. So that it is easier for each one of them to achieve the things they want to achieve. Complementary skills. Okay. Here's my value proposition. And I'm, I'm popping this up because as I go through strategic partnering, I want you to understand how I used my value proposition as a strategic partner to have over 350 conversations with syndications and syndicators and sponsors in 2021. Blew my calendar up with this value proposition. But as we go through, I'm going to show you where my value was and what my roles were, um, though you'll probably be able to recognize them pretty quickly. So I'm looking to build strategic partnerships with active, established syndicator sponsors and key principles where I bring the value of understanding, calculating, and identifying emerging markets, finding off-market opportunities, conducting market and feasibility analysis, expertise in due diligence and underwriting, and assisting in capital raising without taking a piece of the GP, and I'm looking to invest passively in the deals. Pretty powerful statement, isn't it? So out of that, what roles did I play? Well, first, let's identify what those roles are of a strategic partner or what can be. Okay, first is acquisition. Probably there, there's two that are top of the list. Acquisition and capital raising. Right now, capital raising is number one because investors have become weary 
of the syndication game. And trust me, it's been a game. So your, your easiest way in is if you have the ability to bring money to the table from investment partners. The next way is acquisition direct to owner, not from a broker, not from a bird dog or anything else, direct to owner, okay? Bring that deal to the table. Now you've got some negotiating room. Underwriting, if you're really, really good at underwriting, then uh, it is a demand. There is a demand for underwriters on these syndication teams primarily because they've spent the last four or five years underwriting hundreds of deals a week. They're about burned out from it. So they are looking for people that will help them underwrite deals. Market and feasibility analysis. I'm currently in the middle of a project in California for a ground up development in the Bay Area. Uh, and I'm doing a market and feasibility analysis as a strategic consultant. And I'm... Uh, receiving a six figure fee from this and I'm putting six figures of that fee bringing five figures still to the house but putting six figures of that fee back into the deal as a passive investor so there's multiple ways you can get paid as a strategic partner or in my case a strategic consultant Demand supply analysis. Now, my demand supply analysis is included with that market and feasibility analysis. You can kind of combine those two together if you wanted to. Or I typically will do just a simple demand supply analysis for someone for a smaller fee, somewhere around five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. Capital raising. Again, number one in the syndication world right now. If you're a capital raiser, there's a demand for you. <coughs> but you better be careful because the SEC is watching. Project management, you have a PMP, uh, which is a project management professional license. You're in high demand because of value add projects or ground up construction, things that might be happening. Project managers are always in high demand. Boots on the ground, okay? Uh, just had a conversation with a wonderful lady out of California that invests in Dallas and she, her partner is in Dallas. So she has her boots on the ground where you're investing or where you're living. If you want to be that boots on the ground, it's imperative that you have boots on the ground in that market. So if you are in a market and you're raising your hand saying, I'm willing to be that gopher, because that's what a boots on the ground is. They go for this, go for that, you know, go talk to this manager or go meet with this broker or go or to the tour this property you're the gopher um which is fine because you can still get paid for that activity and it is a way to get you started asset manager the most important and hardest role in this business this is not for the beginner this is not for the faint-hearted and if you don't know operations or property management, do not take on this role. Those are the two most important things, operations and uh, property management. And you've got to be a great communicator because if communication breaks down between the asset manager, asset manager and the team, this, the entire project is probably going to be doomed. Communication is the key. Investor relations. Uh, that could be tied in with uh, the asset manager, or maybe you're just uh, speaking with the investors on your own. <clears throat> I hate this cold. Due diligence support. Again, that would be part of boots on the ground, but you may have expertise in due diligence like I do, and you'd be willing to travel to do due diligence support for projects. Tax saving strategies. This is really good for CPAs and for cost segregation engineers. Legal strategies. If you're an attorney, insurance brokerage services and mortgage brokerage services. And last but not least, we save the best for last for the real estate brokers. Okay, These are all ways we can get paid in a transaction without owning the property. But like I've done when I negotiated that feasibility analysis, you can negotiate part of that fee for me, the majority of the fee 
to go into the deal so that you can build your wealth, which if that's your goal, should be something you look forward to doing. Otherwise, if you're a cash flow investor, it may be a little different. We'll talk about that. So what were my roles in my value proposition? Identifying emerging markets, finding off-market opportunities, conducting market and feasibility analysis, due diligence and underwriting, and capital raising. Okay, those were the roles that I displayed inside of my value proposition. So what role do you want? Well, David, I have no idea. What should I do? Should I be a capital raiser? I don't know. Are you passionate about raising capital? Are you passionate about communicating between the asset manager and the sponsor and your investors? Are you passionate about risking your investors' money in a deal that you really don't have control over? Okay, you gotta have passion for that. What are you passionate about? What are you the best at? Or what can you become the best at? You don't have to be the best at it today. <laughs> but what can you become the best at? Is there demand for it? Remember, we talked about the two most important were capital raising and um, off market. Probably number three, boots on the ground. Okay. These are very, very important roles that syndicators look for today. That is called demand. Is there demand for it? So you have continuous education on your passion so that you can become valuable. Yeah, you've got to become valuable to the marketplace. My experience, my education, the fact I teach market and feasibility analysis for the CCIM Institute gives me the ability to be valuable to the marketplace so I can ask for a six-figure contract for doing a market infeasibility for a ground-up development project. You can do the same thing. It takes time to get there, but you got to start somewhere. So where's the value in my value proposition? After all, it is a value proposition, right? Emerging markets, everybody always tries to seek out emerging markets. I'm going to be honest with you. They're kind of irrelevant, but you know, a guru said they were the most important thing in the world. So it, that's what everybody believes. Back to Jim Rohn. Don't be a follower. Be a student. Don't follow a guru. Be a student of everybody's education, including fundamental principles and formal education like CCIM's education. Okay. Off-market, everybody loves off-market opportunities. There's value. Oh, here's a big one. Without taking a piece of the GP, trust me, I don't want anything to do with the general partnership. Okay, And I want to invest passively in the deal. If I found that the deal was not worth investing in, I did not take on the strategic partnering role. I would only take on a strategic partnering role if I could invest in the deal. And if the numbers didn't work for me, I didn't do the deal. And there was only two that I looked at in 2021 that even made me decide to be a strategic partner. One, we didn't end up closing on the property because it was not as advertised. And I mean, really bad, not as advertised. And the second one was I got screwed over by the sponsors. My fault for not having a contract in place first. Okay. All right, so what is the fee structure of a strategic partner? How do we get paid? Well, you can get a percentage of the GP if that's what you want. Me personally, I want nothing to do with the general partnership side, okay? Especially since I have no control. Because if you position yourself that way, you are put in a position of authority. And if something goes wrong, you can be blamed by the people that you brought to that deal. Me? Mm -mm. Nope, not happening you can get a percentage of the acquisition fee. Now, this is a good one right here. See, you want a percentage of that acquisition fee. If you found an opportunity, an off-market deal, because you used Acquisition Pro and you let Acquisition Pro do its magic with the strategic acquisition system, and you found an owner that was willing to sell, but you didn't have the ability to close on it, or maybe you didn't like the deal that much, then 
you can go to a syndication student and say, hey, I got this off-market deal. They'll suck it up really fast, but you get a, an agreement signed first that says, first, you will not compete with me. You will not disclose any of this information and you will pay me umpty scratch of a acquisition fee after you close on the deal. The key here is that you do not negotiate with the owner or the buyer to an agreement. No, mm -mm. you negotiate with the buyer your fee between them and you let the owner know, hey, I got a buyer that's interested in this. Is it okay if I bring them into this deal? And you do that, but you do not negotiate between the buyer and seller to come to an agreement. Nope, nope. That's what brokers do. And you will cross the line of being illegal if you do that. As long as you do not negotiate for the buyer and the seller together, you're fine. You can bird dog that way. That is the legal way to do it. Now you're just a consultant. You're a acquisitions consultant. Okay. Love that word consultant. So get a percentage of that acquisition fee. I like, if you bring the deal, I want half. You wouldn't have it if I didn't bring it. So if they're going to get a 3% acquisition fee, I want a percent and a half. If they're going to get two, I want 2%. I want 1%. If they're going to get a 1% acquisition fee because they're ethical, I want a half a percent. Okay. I brought the deal, not them, me. So that's what I asked for, half. Be willing to negotiate lower if you like the opportunity, okay? But don't give it away. Percentage of asset management fee. If you're on the asset management team, if you're not on the asset management team, you're not gonna get a percentage of the asset management fee. Consulting fee. I've thrown that out there a couple of times, haven't I? Just about everything on that list you can get a consulting fee for, okay? The one you've got to be careful of is the capital raising. Do not ask for a fee based on the amount of capital you have raised. If you've agreed to bring a million dollars to the table, then your fee cannot be based on that million dollars. So we're going to give you, you know, 1% of a million dollars to bring it to the table. We give you a 10% GP to bring that. No, no, no. You want an acquisition fee of the entire project amount, not the amount of capital raised. If you get caught, you can be found in violation of SEC guidelines. Don't do it. Get a loan broker fee. If you bring the debt to the deal, you don't need a license to be a commercial loan broker. So if this is a larger product, not a two to four unit, if it's a two to four unit, you must be a licensed mortgage broker in order to uh, bring uh, or get paid for a residential loan. Commercial loans, five units or more, do not require a mortgage broker's license in 47 states. I don't remember what the three states are. You can look it up. It's easy to find online. But 47 states do not require a commercial brokerage license to bring commercial debt to the transaction. So you can get a mortgage broker fee. Real estate broker fee. If you're a real estate broker, get your brokerage fee. Okay. I would not try to get an acquisition fee if you're a, an agent and not a broker and you work under a broker to try to circumvent your broker. Do not do that. We're not doing this to circumvent our brokers. Please don't do that. If you're legitimately investing in this deal, have that conversation with your broker and see how that fee structure is going to work between the broker, you, and the transaction, and then figure out how you're going to structure it that way. Never try to cut your broker out or circumvent your brokerage. That will just end badly for you. And then an insurance brokerage fee. If you're an insurance broker, if you just bring an insurance guy to the table, um, that's just an introduction. I don't know. I don't believe insurance brokers can pay bird dogs a referral fee. If they can, maybe you can get something from uh, an insurance broker. But I, uh, in the area I live, and I've been told by friends of mine that are insurance brokers that you, they cannot pay outside people, just like real estate agents. 
cannot pay or receive money from people that aren't real estate licensed for referrals. So kind of the same uh, industry. All right. So that's how we get paid. So what do we do with it once we got it? Okay. How do we spend it? Well, guess what? There it is again. Depends on your goals. What are your goals? So if your goal, goals are intermittent cash flow, meaning you just want cash. Yeah, you know, I just, I got to have cash. Uh, um, I'm a broker and, you know, I live commission check to commission check. I need cash. Okay, that's intermittent cash flow. You don't have sustainable monthly income. It's intermittent. That's what I'm talking about here. Then there's wealth building. That's consistent monthly passive income. Okay, wealth building is passive, not active. So, first, take it to the house. Either one, take it to the house, okay? If you take it to the house, you're going to pay the tax man the most. If you reinvest it because you're wealth building and you want that consistent cash flow, reinvest up to 80% of it back into the deal. The reason we don't reinvest 100% of it is because the tax man is still going to want their piece. But in this case, you're going to be paying the tax man the least. All right. So that's what you do with your money. And again, it depends on your goals. So save that 20% for the tax man, just in case. All right. So how do you become a strategic partner? Well, create your value proposition. You saw mine, copy it. I don't care. Pause the video, write it down. No worries you doing that. None whatsoever. I let people in my strategic partnering community do it all the time. Prospect on LinkedIn or whatever, wherever your avatar hangs out. Now, when we get to building relationships, I'm going to show you how to automate your prospecting on LinkedIn. It goes beyond the scope of this lesson, but when we get to communications, I'm going to blow your mind with how you can automate using a tool. It's not a bot. It acts more human than a bot. It, it is a bot, but it doesn't act like a bot. And it's been around for three or four years now, and LinkedIn has never blocked it, nor have they ever banned anybody's account for using this tool. So I will show you what that is when we get there. And I'll just give you a hint. You can start researching it now. Linked Helper, okay? Linked Helper will automate your LinkedIn prospecting. I'm gonna show you how to use it when we get there. Build your presence on Facebook and other social media. Guess what? There's a tool that you can use to automate your Facebook presence building by building a group. And when somebody comes into the group, you can get them to ask three questions. One of those questions, if they have an email address, there is a tool that will take that email and integrate it into Acquisition Pro and be able to automate your lead generation into your strategic acquisition system because of GroupKit is the name of the tool but I will show you how to use it when we get to communications. Deliver your value proposition. Once you've built your presence and are prospecting on LinkedIn, deliver your value proposition. I'll show you exactly how to do that in the communication module. And we're leading towards scheduling appointments with folks, whether you're capital raising, whether you're trying to find off-market opportunities, building relationships with JV partners or building relationships with influencers. It doesn't matter. We're working towards scheduling an appointment to build that relationship. And then, of course, win assignments. Okay. So what's the homework? Well, yes, you have homework on this one. Decide what role you want. Okay. Go through the hedgehog concept, which is exactly that tool I showed you. Uh, are you passionate about it? Can you be the best in the world at it? And is there demand for it? If you guys remember Jim Collins, good to great, that is the hedgehog concept. Same exact 
process. So decide what role you want. What can you be the best in the world at? Are you passionate about? And is there a need for it? Determine whether you want to start small or fail big. Okay. If you start small, one or two of you get hurt. Who cares? You guys know each other. You've got a good relationship. You don't have to worry about hundreds of investors in your deal. You fail big. Now we're talking orange jumpsuit, three squares a day and a 12 by 12. Yeah, probably not the route I want to go, but you know, they tell you it's easier to do a hundred unit than it is to do a 10 unit. I'm going to let you decide at this point. All right. So next week we are going to start <coughs> step one of phase one in acquisitions. And we are going to start to build uh, out your goals, determine your legacy lifestyle that you want to live or the number you need in order to quit your W-2 and do this for a living and then how to build and create our company, whether it's an LLC, an uh, a uh, incorporated or like an S-Corp. I wouldn't recommend a C-Corp, but again, I'm not an attorney, nor do I play one or pretend to be one in real or imaginary life. So don't take my advice on that, but we will cover those things in step one. Okay. And those we will start next week. It's been a pleasure having you here today. For those of you that are live, stay here because we are going to hold our Q&A session. For those of you that watch the recording, we will see you Wednesday night at 8 p.m. East if you do have questions. Thank you all. And we'll talk next week.